It's a pleasure uh, to welcome you tonight uh, at uh, the event where we will look at the Ne Ultra Petita principle in international investment arbitration. Uh, the event is co-hosted uh, with uh, Wilma Hale, and we are very thankful for uh, the initiative and for organizing uh, it here uh, in this uh, beautiful room. Uh, I would like to say a few words about the forthcoming events which the Investment Treaty Forum is organizing. Our next event will be on the 8th of March, uh, and uh, it, we will speak there about general principles of law in international investment law and uh, about the hierarchy of norms in, in uh, international law in general. Uh, then uh, we will have our major conference, so usually we have a conference in spring and a conference in autumn, and the conference will be about enforcement issues in international investment law. So we will discuss enforcement of arbitration agreements, enforcement of provisional measures, enforcement of awards, and all complex issues which arise uh, in uh, this context. Uh, I will also uh, in I'm encouraging you also to check the website of the British Institute uh, uh, more regularly this year because it's the 60th anniversary of the British Institute and we are going to organize additional events uh, to mark this anniversary. So the level of speakers uh, and uh, the level of uh, intellectual uh, sort of enjoyment of those events is supposed to be even higher this year because of the anniversary. Uh, but today, uh, I'm not supposed to talk for a very long time. Uh, I will just say that this event uh, is going to be recorded. So we'll have a video recording and also podcasts, which will become publicly available very soon. And uh, with this, I would like uh, to um, thank you for coming here tonight. And uh, I uh, wish you to enjoy uh, the panel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name's Duncan Speller, and I'm a partner here in the arbitration team at Wilma. It's a great honor to co-host this event and to have such a distinguished and international tribunal. It's also a very great pleasure to see some familiar faces and some new faces. So we look forward to a very engaging and hopefully spicy discussion on an interesting theme, um, and to continuing the discussions over a glass of wine afterwards. So without further ado, I'll pass over to the able stewardship of Dr. Daniel Costello, who will um, moderate the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duncan, and good evening, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Professor Maxi Scherer, who originally was meant to chair this, this discussion, is unfortunately long, no longer able to join us, but she sends her apologies. Now, we're extremely lucky this evening for three reasons. The first is that we were, go we're going to learn more about one of the most fundamental principles of international adjudication, the ne ultra petita principle, both under general international law and also with particular reference to the investment treaty arbitration context. In my experience, three words in Latin don't typically trigger much uh, enthusiasm, or in fact, any enthusiasm, <laughs> but I assure you that this is the exception. The second reason is that we have with us a distinguished main speaker, Professor Attila Tanzi. Professor Tanzi holds the Chair of Public International Law at the University of Bologna and has held numerous other academic appointments, including at the University of Verona, the University of Perugia, and Queen Mary University. He acts as counsel and arbitrator in interstate cases, and as arbitrator and legal expert in investment treaty cases. He's also been a longtime legal advisor to Italy's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and was on several occasions a member of Italy's delegation to the Sixth Committee of the UN General Assembly. So thank you for being with us this evening, Attila. Finally, we have with us this evening two distinguished discussants, Sir Franklin Berman and Professor Morris Mendelssohn. Sir Franklin was the legal advisor to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office from 1991 to 1999. The, for the past 17 years, he has been in practice at Essex Court Chambers, where he specializes in international arbitration 
and in advisory work in public international law. In addition, he's a visiting professor at Oxford University and at the University of Cape Town. Sir Franklin has also sat as chairman and as a party appointed arbitrator in several exit arbitrations and in several exit annulment proceedings, uh, as well as in numerous other arbitrations. Professor Mendelssohn is a member of Blackstone Chambers, where his practice covers all aspects of public international law, including sovereignty disputes, the law of the sea, human rights, and investment protection. He also sits as an arbitrator, including in exit cases, and provides expert evidence to foreign courts and to international courts and tribunals. Professor Mendelssohn held the chair of international law at University College London from 1987 to 2001 and also has held numerous other academic appointments. It is difficult to think of two individuals better placed to comment on Professor Tansi's analysis than Sir Frank and Professor Mendelssohn. So thank you both too again for being here this evening. Finally, I thank the Investment Treaty Forum again for co-organizing this event with us. And with that, I turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for your very kind presentation, but thank you more than that for uh, concocting a fantastic stay. And thank you, Duncan and Maxi. Please convey my acknowledgement to Maxis. I have been scholar in residence for two months, and I have been privileged in uh, putting to fruition uh, much of my previous research, complementing it with tremendous research support that I would hardly believe possible from a law firm. But it's never too late to learn. And uh, indeed, thank you very much for that. Um, well, you've been a bit sarcastic about the Latin there. I promise, though, I, I pledge that I will not speak in Latin tonight. <laughs> the lecture is going to be in English, and the few tags will be strictly pronounced with rigid English pronunciation. <laughs> By the way, you know the story of that uh, very Italian Latin file enthusiast of civil law barrister who goes for a stage in Rome at Unidra, and very proudly he comes back to London, and when he first pleads before the English bar, he fills in all his pleadings with Latin texts until he's interrupted by the bench and said, where did you learn that weird pronunciation of Latin? In Rome. Your Honor, the barrister lost the case. <laughs> now, ne ultra petita. The principle whereby an adjudicative body may not decide on issues other than those that are submitted to it finds universal recognition both in domestic jurisdictions and in international jurisdiction, international adjudication. However, in line with the warning given by Judge McNair in his oft-quoted dissenting opinion in Southwest Africa, in international adjudication and arbitration, the principle in hand may not be taken lock, stock, and barrel as a derivative of domestic legal systems. Caution appears advisable certainly in consideration of the differences between common law and civil law legal systems as well as between different jurisdictions within the same system of law. But the primary reason for a separate approach to ne ultra petita in international adjudication and arbitration is to be found in the principles of consensual jurisdiction and of the autonomy of the parties which find no comparator in domestic proceedings. Consequently, much the same dividing line would not apply with respect to international commercial arbitration, actually would apply, as governed by some national law. The relevance of ne ultra petita to commercial arbitration, even if the lex arbitri were to be intended a la Francaise, as it were, that is as embedded in some form of transnational law, 
or other configurations of denationalized arbitration falls outside the scope of today's presentation. I will take international investment arbitration law as an integral part of the law of international adjudication, even though with its modulations. I will largely rely on the idea of an emerging common law of international adjudication of the kind posited by Chester Brown, and this approach is based on persuasive elements deriving from interstates, ISDS, human rights, case law, which tend to converge towards common trends much more than in the domestic case law from different jurisdictions. This common principles-based approach is adopted with a view to serving the practical purpose of complementing the case-specific regulatory frameworks which govern the powers of any given international adjudicative body, which usually do not spell out the ne ultra petita principle in so many words. Within the body of international investment law, I will focus on the ICSIS system, if only for the fact that its annulment mechanism provides a unique form of third-party assessment. This does not exclude that the annulment committees are in their turn bound by the same principle. My presentation will come in four parts. First, a broad brush picture will be given of the contour of the principle, drawing from the wider context of interstate adjudication. Neutra petita will be illustrated in strict relation to its corollary principles, such as the autonomy of the parties and the right to be heard. But among such ancillary principles, primary attention will be given to ne infra petita, regarded as the other side of the same coin, and to jura novit curia as the counterbalance to ne ultra petita. Second, I will address the scope of the procedural stages in which the principles in hand operate, well known. Third, I will deal with how ultra petita words as well as infra petita ones, may incur in a ground for annulment under Article 52.1 of the ICSIC Convention. Fourth, the application of the principles in hand will be shortly discussed with special regard to the awarding of relief. Ne ultra petita directly flows and it's entangled with the three pillars making up the mandate of an international adjudicative body. First, its jurisdictional requirements. Second, the rules on the applicable law. And third, the claims put forward by the parties which delineate the contour of the dispute. As put it by Judge Fitzmaurice, Quote, the non ultra petita rule is a derivative of the consent principle. End quote. The relation of the principle in question to the three pillars is probably the one, the number one, which is requiring closer attention, since, it, since it's hardly ever benefits from the written regulatory support which you find usually concerning jurisdictional requirements and the determination of the applicable law. In the asylum case between Colombia and Peru, the International Court of Justice stressed, quote, it is the duty of the court not only to reply to the questions as stated in the final submissions of the parties, but also to abstain from deciding points not included in the submissions, unquote. In Barcelona Traction, the court found that it did not have the jurisdictional power to apply the rules pertaining to the treatment of shareholders simply because it noted from the Belgian application and the Spanish reply that those rules had not been invoked by the parties. In the boundary disputes between Argentina and Chile, the tribunal felt the need to stress that the competence, and I quote, the competence of international judges is limited by the stream claims which the parties put forward in the hearings, unquote. In terms most germane to the question as to whether 
ne ultra petita establishes a ground for annulment under the ICSID system, the arbitration tribunal also emphasized that, quote, to exceed these functions or powers means deciding ultra virus and rendering the decision null by reason of excès de pouvoir, unquote. By limiting the powers of the tribunal to pass judgment exclusively on the claims advanced by the parties as constitutive of the dispute that it is asked to settle, the principle in point is also linked to the second pillar of a tribunal's mandate, namely the applicable law, and inevitably to the first one, since the scope of the jurisdictional competence is confined to the applicable law. There, the question arises as to whether a court or tribunal is entitled to apply rules which pertain to the dispute before it, but have not been invoked by the parties. It is in this context that the interaction between ne ultra petita and Nura Novat Curia comes into play. It is worth recalling that it was with regard to the identification of the applicable legal standards for the delimitation of the continental shelf between Libya and Malta that the ICJ maintained that, quote, the court must not exceed the jurisdiction conferred upon it by the parties, but it must exercise that jurisdiction to its full extent, unquote. Indeed, after noting that the special agreement did not indicate the rules providing the methods for the delimitation, it stated, quote, since the court is required to decide how in practice the principles and rules of international law can be applied in order that the parties may delimit the continental shelf, this necessarily entails the indication by the court of the method or methods which it considers to result from the proper application of the appropriate rules and principles." Unquote. This passage seems to allude to the fact that Jura Novit Curia may not only be taken as a power, but also as an obligation. More generally, the two principles in hand serve two different rationales. Ne ultra petita reflects and gives effect to the consensual nature of international adjudication, while Uranovit Curia is an expression of the countervailing judicial autonomy principle. Their intersection at the balance calibrated point appears key to the proper administration of justice. Uranovit Curia forced the tribunal with the jurisdictional power, possibly the duty, to apply the applicable law to its fullest extent. Ne ultra petita impinges upon Jura Novit Curia by preventing the court or tribunal from relying on rules and legal arguments which would recharacterize the dispute brought before it. I will close this initial broad brush illustration by drawing from the ICJ case law, particularly from the just referred dictum in Libya Malta, that, quote, an international tribunal, tribunal will not decide more than it is asked to decide, and decide, unquote, but by the same token, it will not decide less than it is asked to decide. This amounts to say that ne ultra petita implies ne infra petita. And this is in line with the non-liquid principle, which also finds recognition in the ICSID regulatory framework. I shall now turn to the investment arbitration context with special regard to ICSID, for the reason just alluded to, concerning the unique annulment mechanism that you find there. There as well, the characterization of ne ultra petita emer emerges as, at one at the same time as the rule which derives from and gives effect to the three-pronged boundaries of a tribunal's mandate. First, its jurisdictional requirements under Article 25 of the ICSID Convention. Second, the rules on the applicable law under Article 42.1. Three, the claims put forward by the parties which define the dispute. The first ICSID annulment decision in 
85 in Klöckner versus Cameroon, you find an exemplary application in investment law of ne ultra petita in combination with related principles in the direction which emerge from the interstate adjudication which I've just illustrated. The committee addressed ne ultra petita first under the manifest excess of power ground as follows, quote, it matters little in principle that the tribunal's legal construction was different from the one or the other of the parties, so long as the right of each to be heard was respected, and so long as it remains within the legal framework provided by the parties." Unquote. The committee addressed the same issue also under the serious departure from the fundamental rule of procedure ground. It rejected the claimant's complaint by stating that the tribunal, quote, was not in principle prohibited from choosing its own argument, unquote. And there it reiterated, quote, the real question is whether by formulating its own theory and argument, the tribunal goes beyond the legal framework established by the claimant and the respondent, unquote. Eventually, the committee did annul the award under excess of power considerations because it found that the tribunal had gone beyond the legal framework provided by the parties. Because it decided ex equit bono without the agreement of the parties, hence outside the framework provided by Article 42 of the ITSID Convention. Indications emerge from the case law also to the effect that the principles in point should not prevent arbitrators from legally recharacterizing the facts on record beyond the arguments pleaded by the parties, so long as they do so within the boundaries of the applicable law and the contour of the claim. And this requires the mutual balancing between ne ultra petita and jura novit curia. A key catalyst to that effect may be found in the application of the fundamental procedural right of the parties to be heard. The point had been made in the first annulment decision, Klerkner, and has been increasingly corroborated by the following case law. The committee in Vivendi 1 rejected the request for annulment for departure from a fundamental rule of procedure due to an alleged ultra petita decision precisely based on the assessment that, quote, the parties had a full and fair opportunity to be heard at every stage of the proceedings, unquote. The subsequent case law has mitigated somewhat the relevance of the procedural right to be heard as a requirement for the tribunal to go beyond the arguments submitted to it. In 2014, the Carrot Tube Ad Hoc Committee provided the, a qualification to Professor Schroyer's assessment that the annulment case law has, quote, uniformly rejected the idea that tribunals in drafting their awards are restricted to the arguments presented by the parties, unquote. I mean, that was Professor Schroyer's view. To that end, the Carrot Tube Committee maintained, quote, a tribunal, and also a committee, is only free to adopt its own resolution and reasoning without obligation to submit it to the parties beforehand if it remains within the legal framework established by the parties, unquote. Here the committee basically reiterated the two preconditions set out in Klerkner 1 for a tribunal to exercise its jurisdictional autonomy, including Jura Novit Curia, in a calibrated combination with the party autonomy, that is, within the boundaries of the dispute as defined by the application and the reply and by the right of the parties to be heard. Compliance with the right of the parties to be heard appears to have been clearly regarded as an effective antidote ex ex against annulment for ultra petita determinations in Quiberax versus Bolivia in 2015. It stated, quote, when applying the law, whether national or international, the tribunal is of the view that it is not bound by the arguments and sources invoked by the parties 
the principal Jura Novit Curia, or better, Jura Novit Arbiter, allows the tribunal to form its own opinion of the meaning of the law, provided that it does not surprise the parties with a legal theory that was not subject to debate and that the parties could not anticipate." Unquote. I will now turn to the other side of the coin, namely in name frappetita. As emphasized again by, by Professor Schroer, Quote, the requirement that the award must deal exhaustively with the dispute as submitted by the parties is one of the general principles underlying arbitration, unquote. And he goes on to stress, quote, an award that is not comprehensive and exhaustive of the parties' questions amounts to an excess of powers just like a decision on questions that have not been submitted to the tribunal, unquote. Very much in line with the Libya Malta dictum mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the ad hoc committee in Vivendi 1 stated, quote, an ICSID tribunal commits an excess of powers not only when it exercises a jurisdiction which it does not have under the relevant agreement or treaty under the ICSID convention, but it also fails to exercise a jurisdiction which it possesses under those instruments, unquote. The assessment of the scope of the ne infra petita may help addressing an ancillary vexed question, namely whether the arbitrators have only the power or also the obligation, A, to address elements of law and fact that are relevant to the decision of the dispute and which the parties have not pleaded, and B, to review all of the legal arguments and the evidentiary record submitted by the parties that are es essential to the decision of the dispute. Now there comes a distinction between law and facts. Now indeed, lack of consideration of facts on record may affect the application of the law. While under Article 43 of the ICSID Convention, the tribunal may require the parties to produce evidence, conversely, when facts adduced by the parties are not addressed, which would be determinant for its decision, an infra petita problem would arise. And I will revert to this point in relation to the grounds for annulment. I will now address the application of the principles in point in different proceedings or arbitral phases. A, annulment proceedings, B, provisional measures, and C, jurisdiction. The principles in question certainly apply to annulment proceedings themselves. Ad hoc committees are certainly bound to confine their assessments within the ICSID regulatory framework and the application by the applicant. However, ne ultra petita does not apply when it comes to decide between partial and complete annulment. In Vivendi 1, the committee stated, quote, where a ground for annulment is established, it is for the ad hoc committee and not for the requesting party to determine the extent of the annulment. In making this determination, the committee is not bound by the applicant's characterization of its request, unquote. The compression of ne ultra petita here is dictated by the very rationale of the annulment jurisdiction. As stressed in Klerkner II, the annulment procedure is above all a procedure for the protection of the law. It is not instituted merely in the interest of the parties." Unquote. Consistently with this rationale, the discretion of the committee is constrained by the ICSID regulatory framework even more than by just ne ultra petita, to the effect that under Article 52 it is precluded from reviewing an award on the merits. That is to say that the annulment procedure is not to be conflated with an annulment with an appellate mechanism. As much as the dividing line between the two has in principle been consistently restated in the case law, in practice the temptation is high for ad hoc committees to engage in review of alleged errors of law. 
The SEMPRA and Enron annulment decisions in 2010 have stirred much debate on the issue. In particular, the critique would go that the committees had engaged in ultra petita reasoning both when deciding for the annulment and even when rejecting the application for annulment, thus arguably undermining the legitimacy of the award and its smooth enforcement. Apart from the scholarly and social scrutiny, for good or bad, a committee's reasoning may incur in some form of very indirect judicial review in case of resubmission and remotely by a second ad hoc committee. To my knowledge, there have been to date eight resubmissions. Three of them produced new awards which were in their turn subject to annulment proceedings. I will now briefly mention how an ultra petita is relevant by way of exception, at least partially, to proceedings on provisional measures and to jurisdiction and admissibility. As to incidental proceedings in provisional measures, first, the rules of procedure of the ICJ, ITLOS, European Court of Human Rights, and Inter-American Court of Human Rights all recognize the power to grant provisional measures more to proprio, and even more so ultra petita when requested by a party. The ancient case law has never been problematic on the pointed issue in such forums. But when it comes to international investment arbitration, one may consider that under the ancestral arbitration rules of 2010, the SEC rules, the ICC rules, the LCIA rules, provisional measures may be ordered only at the request of a party. On the other hand, in concordance with interstate adjudication, Article 47 of the Convention, I mean the Exit Convention, and 39.3 of the Arbitration Rules afford Exit Tribunals the power to recommend provisional measures motu proprio. The compression of the autonomy of the party's principle, and thus of ne ultra petita, in those proceedings, is further enhanced, also in line with international adjudication, by the power of the Tribunal to recommend measures other than those specified in the request. But here again, the right of the parties to be heard under a procedural evergreen countervailing judicial, judicial autonomy comes into play. The discretion of the tribunal is somewhat further mitigated by the rule contained in 39.2 of the arbitration rules under ICSID framework, where the tribunal is if the tribunal is minded to recommend measure, is bound to give priority to consideration of the measures which may have been requested. And most importantly, Article 47 of the Convention provides that the power in hand may be done away with the agreement of the parties. In the assessment of a tribunal's own jurisdiction, the governing principle here is obviously the competence-competence principle, under which Jura Novit Curia operates to the full extent as an obligation for the tribunal to ascertain its jurisdiction, even more to proprio, thus to the exclusion of the ultra petita. The competence-competence principle, as enshrined in the procedural rules under the ICJ statute, the ITLOS, the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter American Court of Human Rights, is set out in Article 41 of the ICSID Convention and 41.2 of the Arbitration Rules. And there the question arises as to whether the tribunal's decision may be taken irrespective of the position of the parties. An answer in the affirmative may be inferred from the award on jurisdiction in Mikula in the sense that, within the duty to ascertain uh, its jurisdiction, quote, a tribunal can rule on and decline its jurisdiction even where no objection to jurisdiction is raised, unquote, with the only qualification that it has the power to do so, quote, on the basis of the record, unquote. 
The duty in question is further complicated in the case of the absentia of the respondent. The ad hoc committee in uh, Libanenko versus Turkey seems to have confined the power and duty for tribunals to assess their jurisdiction within the margins of the grounds pleaded by the parties. But one may find it difficult for a tribunal to comply with the duty to assert its own jurisdictional competence while confining it to the grounds pleading by the parties. In line with such concerns, more recently, Inikale in Saad limited Sikerti versus Turkmenistan, the tribunal took the view that it was not bound by the legal positions advanced by the parties, not even where the parties agreed. There again, the evergreen right of the parties to be heard takes the spotlight as a procedural requirement, even if the tribunal is not bound by the parties' arguments. The discretion afforded to tribunals under the ICSID regulatory framework that not, does not subtract, subtract an award on jurisdiction from annulment scrutiny, as stated in Lucchetti versus Peru, and further corroborated by the subsequent annulment case law, where tribunals assert their jurisdiction matters falling outside their competence or commercially when they refuse to exercise their jurisdiction in matters for which they are competent, they incur in an excess of power. Indeed, as straightforwardly emphasized in the Azurix Ad Hoc Committee, the annulment procedure on the ground of excess of powers is general and makes no exception for issues of jurisdiction. I shall now turn to the grounds for annulment. The last point that I touched upon naturally ushers us into the question as to whether and how an ultra or infra petite award may establish a ground for annulment under Article 50.1 of the ICSID Convention. It's important to recall that the ICSID system is based on the principle of decisional finality. And I would recall Article 53.1 to that end. Therefore, the points at issue should be discussed against the framework to the fact that none of the annulment grounds should be conflated with the grounds for appeal. While a manifest excess of power is, prevailing, is the prevailing ground for annulment applications involving ultra infra petita complaints, the case law shows that also failure to state reasons and a serious departure from a fundamental rule of procedure are also referred to often on an accumulative basis. Manifest excess of power is the prevailing ground for applications. It is no wonder that this ground for annulment has been regarded as a comparator for Article 5.1c of the 1958 New York Convention. It may be recalled that this provision allows for domestic courts to refuse enforcement of an award that is deemed to address a dispute which is different from the one submitted to arbitration, or which decided questions that go beyond the scope of the submissions. In fact, the travaux of the ICSID Convention show that the manifest excess of power ground was envisaged mainly, if not exclusively, for purposes of sanctioning penalty awards incurring in ultra petita. A delicate issue arises here which does not seem to have been settled by the case law, namely the determination of the criteria to assess the threshold between a manifest and a non-manifest excess of power. And the issue is particularly delicate as it bears directly on the boundaries of the annulment jurisdiction as opposed to the appellate jurisdiction. The issue was clearly identified by, en by the Enron Ad Hoc Committee, highlighting the distinction, quote, between the non-application of the applicable law, which is a ground for annulment, and an incorrect application of the applicable law, which is not, unquote. Though, it did so only to tell us that, quote, this is a distinction that may not always be easy to draw, unquote. Here, the case law is definitely fluctuating. 
On the one hand, one finds the outright rejection of the power of annulment for an error of law confining such power to non-application of the applicable law, as stated by the committee in Impregilo versus Argentina in 2014. And this position seems in line with the rationale of Article 52 of the Convention and its travaux. But on the other hand, one finds a long string of modulations of the stand according to which an ad hoc committee could annul an award also for misapplication of the law, such modulations bearing on the degree of the magnitude of the error of law. For example, the committee in consortium RFCC versus Morocco was content with manifest error with respect to which it claimed to retain a measure of discretion. This approach was followed by the Vivendi II Committee, and I will shortly refer, refer, revert to this issue in relation to the emerging trends in the annulment case law more generally. Applications for annulment pertinent to ultra petita have also been based on a serious departure from a fundamental rule of procedure. The procedural right of the parties to be heard turns out again to be ancillary also to this ground for annulment. This is corroborated by significant, to a significant extent by extensive exit arbitration annulment case law. The committee in Vivendi won for it to assess that the disputed award was not vitiated by the ground in question in the sense that it was in no sense ultra petita, it satisfied itself that, quote, from the record it was evident that the parties had full and fair opportunity to be heard at every stage of their proceedings, unquote. However, as already highlighted, the prevailing case law requires the right of the parties to be heard with regard to legal arguments which the tribunal, by which the tribunal would recharacterize the claim or a cause of action. And this appears to be but an application of the plain contour of ne ultra petita in combination with una novit curia. The third ground for annulment, failure to state reasons, may also be relevant to an alleged ultra petita award. Article 48.3 of the Convention provides that, quote, the award shall deal with every question submitted to the tribunal and shall state the reasons upon which it is based, unquote. This provision is primarily relevant for the infra petita purposes when the award falls short of addressing all the relevant questions submitted to it. At the same time, by requiring the tribunal to address all the questions submitted to it, the provision in hand equally implies that the tribunal is prevented from dealing with questions that have not been submitted. Now, reverting to the two requirements set out in Article 48.3, one is to recall that arti under Article 52, failure to state reason is a ground for annulment, but failure to deal with every question is not. Actually, the remedy envisaged for failing to deal with every question is the supplementation of the award by the same tribunal under Article 49.2. Actually, there are questions and questions. Against the general background of the principles under consideration as revolving around the intersection between the party autonomy and judicial autonomy principles, for a failure to deal with a question to ground an annulment application, the question or questions in point must bear significantly on the cause of action, the related claims, and the defenses, thus on the characterization of the dispute. According to the terminology used by a number of ad hoc committees, those are, quote, essential, decisive questions that exceed the threshold of supplementation under 49.2 and consequently fall under the annulment regime set out in 52.1. 
The ground under consideration is suitable for applications for annulment, particularly in relation to the ultra petite awards. On the whole, the ICSID case law shows that the margins of discretion for sanctioning an ultra petite award with annulment range over the same three grounds as set to set aside an award that we have seen applicable to ne ultra petita. The prevailing jurisprudential attitude at this point seems to draw from Article 48.3, according to which the basic ground for annulment is failure to deal with all question. And that would be a failure to state reasons. But confining ne ultra petita considerations to this ground would seem to put a very high threshold for setting aside infra petita award. As argued by the ad hoc committee in Mine versus Guinea and Wiener Hotel versus Egypt, an award would be annulled under this ground only to the extent that the failure in question renders the award, quote, unintelligible. But one may think of fully intelligible awards that incur nonetheless in the infra petita, would it not? As already alluded, in rendering an award which falls short of considering essential questions in dispute, a tribunal fails to fulfill its mandate. Under such circumstances, there seems to be no imperative reason under the ICSID regulatory framework that would prevent annulment on the basis of a manifest excess of power or a serious departure from a fundamental rule of procedure, as the case may be. The ad hoc committee in Klerkner 1, even though opting for failure to state reasons, left nonetheless open the possibility to qualify the failure to address all questions as a serious departure from a fundamental rule of procedure. That this was the ground under similar circumstances which based uh, the examination of the same issue in the CDS versus Seychelles. In the first AMCO versus Indonesia annulment, the committee also relied on failure to state reasons, but maintained that a serious departure from a fundamental rule of procedure or even a manifest excess of power could equally apply, as later corroborated in Vivendi. One, two overarching, I'm about to come to the close, two overarching indications deserve highlighting which emerge consistently from the case law on annulment. The first one is that the major antidote against annulment for ultra petita determination under all three grounds in question is for tribunals to ensure that the right of the parties to be heard is fully complied with. Needless to say, this would not amount to a license to engage in outright ultra petita decisions. Though a departure from the right to be heard on additional arguments that the tribunal intends to follow in its ratio decedent die may easily substantiate the presumption of an ultra petita decision. A second indication most germane to today's topic that seems worth singling out pertains to the recurrent assertion of a considerable amount of discretion as to whether to appall or reject an application of annulment, even if a ground listed under Article 52 is being determined to exist. This has been asserted recently in Tulip and Saur ad hoc annulment cases. The overwhelming majority of the annulment case law concur in that such discretion is not unlimited but the criteria in order to determine the cutoff point seem to require further jurisprudential elaboration. I will close, as you normally close a pleading, on prayer for relief. I will address the issue of relief in relation to the point at issue. In 1949, decision on compensation in the Corfu Channel case the court appointed experts, and they estimated the damage suffered by the UK at a higher figure than that submitted by the applicant. Nonetheless, the court decided that, quote, 
it could not award more than the amount claimed in the submissions, unquote. Similarly, in Rainbow Warrior, the tribunal decided that it would not make an order for monetary compensation since it had not been sought by New Zealand nor pleaded by France as a substitute for the request by the applicant for the return of the French agents to the island. The choice between awarding monetary compensation and restitution is problematic. Under Article 43.2b of the ILC Article on State Responsibility, the applicant is afforded some right of election between restitution in kind and compensation, though the ILC in its commentary added the rather general caveat whereby the provision in point, quote, does not set forth the right of election in absolute terms, unquote. The Commission did not shed further light on the issue. The international investment case law shows the overwhelming prevailing relief in monetary compensation. This is generally due to the prayer for relief submitted by claimants who usually resort to arbitration once the relationship with the local authorities is compromised. But considerations under Article 54.3 of the ICSI Convention may also apply since this provision provides for compulsory enforceability only of pecuniary obligations stemming from the award. In Goetz versus Burundi, the claimant had demanded specific performance consisting of the restatement of tax and custom free zone. The tribunal shifted the right of election of the applicant to the respondent right to choose based on a soi-disant sovereign discretion doctrine. The tribunal was probably well advised to follow this course of action in order to avoid to incur in an ultra petite award when affording the claimant a relief other than the, the one requested. Conclusions. The application of ne ultra petita in investment arbitration appears to follow very much the rationale emerging from interstate adjudication, namely a calibrated blend of the principle in hand together with the ancillary rules and principles that purport to strike a balance between the autonomy of the parties and the judicial autonomy principle. However, in international adjudication, the regulatory contour of such principles appear far from having a precise delineation. Therefore, today's topic can be an area to be further explored in which investment arbitration can make an impact on general international law and not just the other way around, as advocated in a recent contribution by Judge Sima and Dirk Pulskowski. Thank you very much for bearing with some 50 minutes. Thank you.